We are, of course, finishing up the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John today, and just to review the setting, so to speak, and Christ has yielded up his spirit into the hands of his heavenly Father, and that, of course, was according to the predetermined plan of the ages, and completed the redemption of those that have believed, will believe, throughout the history of mankind. Finished was the cry that rang out from the cross that day, a shouted acclamation of victory. It was effective, complete, and perfect, and that which provided all the way from the Garden of Eden through the Great White Throne Judgment, and the eternity beyond. The veil in the temple has been rent significantly from top to bottom, showing that it was God who rent that, and you have to visualize the fact that there was most likely threads remaining on the bottom as that veil was rent to show that it was God that was doing it from the top down, so to speak. This, of course, demonstrated that now, on this side of the cross, on this side of that finished work, that there was a new way that God had provided for mankind to access the throne of heaven itself. It, uh, as Hebrews notes in chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 19, it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The holiest is a reference to the very, uh, in the Old Testament would have been the holy place, the holy of holies, where the Shekinah glory of God came and so forth. Uh, into the holiest, talking about the very immediate proximity of God's glory by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, okay? making it very specific that is there. Just a, a tiny bit further on in that chapter, a few verses later, we find in verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have perceived the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but only a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Uh, talking about the completed work, the finished work, the perfected work of mankind's redemption. There's nothing you can add to it and we dare not take anything away from it. It is sufficient. It is finished. Okay? John's gospel account now, uh, picking up with verse 31, uh, furnishes kind of two separate, they're, they're joined, but they're uh, distinct as well, two capsules of information that kind of bridge the chronology between Christ hanging on the cross uh, and the resurrection that occurs in chapter 20. Uh, this first capsule uh, really uh, deals with the certainty of Christ's death, uh, something that you may not think of as worth the time to even think about, really, or discuss, but yet it is, and we'll explore that momentarily, the second capsule addresses the funeral preparations for the body. So let's look at them. The first one beginning in verse 31 uh, tells us this. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him, with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, who was in the middle, he said, and saw that he was already dead, they broke not, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came to their blood and water. And he saw the, and bore record and his record is true. This is actually John here. And he knows that he, what he says is true, that you might believe. 
for these things were done that the scripture would be fulfilled the bone of him shall not be broken and again another scripture says they shall look upon him whom they have pierced details are found in this little section of verses that deal with the chronology uh of the day that's involved at this point this uh the passover week is drawing to a close and there were specific prohibitions according to jewish law concerning bodies and crucifixions and burial preparations and all of that that's what this passage deals with but john records something special this passover week distinctive from others contained a high day not just the passover day but what was termed a high day which changes things a little bit changes the normal observances a high day essentially provided a double sabbath okay in other words two saturdays except the one would be on friday uh and the reason for that was so that well you know you know how governmental authorities are if a little bit is good more is better uh you know uh well they wanted to make sure that uh, all the observances of the religious aspects of the passover week were completely uh, taken care of and for we did i don't know why but this there was a high day a double sabbath inserted into this week indicates that friday and saturday would have been observed with that no work principle that was part of the jewish law you can do no work on the sabbath the ten commandments right okay essentially this would mean by the way that and we'll talk about this just for a minute or two that jesus would have been crucified on thursday in the middle of the day not friday okay uh, i know that there are a lot of modern tradition for centuries and especially western christendom you know it goes with the good friday thing and everything else but let's kind of examine it Let, let's look at what jesus had prophesied about himself in matthew chapter 12 he said this to his disciples as jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth jesus specifically referred to three days and three nights okay uh regarding jonah and then used that to indicate that he himself would follow the the same protocol if we see christ crucified on friday afternoon then you only have two nights you have friday night and saturday night because we know he rose the first day of the week okay uh but and then but what about what about sunday okay what about sunday uh you know actually according to the way the jews figured things sunday didn't count sunday was not the it, it, sorry it didn't work but why is this well because the jewish day considered was considered to be 6 a.m to 6 p.m the 12 hours they considered to be daylight hours uh, you remember when Mary showed up at the tomb before daylight? You find it in chapter 20, verse 1, by the way. And it's yet still dark. Christ has already risen. He's already gone. Okay? So actually, he was resurrected at the end of the third night. Uh, you know, if you're looking at it from the Jewish perspective. The days then would have been Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And the nights would have been counted the same way, and that would have filled in. Now, now, b before you scream blasphemy, you know, and head out on the hill to, you know, you know, burn a stray dog or something as a sacrifice, uh, don't die on this hill. It's not, it's not worth it. You know, some people see it traditionally as Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You know, but it, what I, and I realize you've got all kinds of a tradition in Western Christendom concerning Good Friday. I'm just pointing out, if you're going to reconcile what Scripture actually says with the chronology, 
that's what you're going to have to work with ok so moving along we come to the leg breaking that is spoken of in verse thirty two this was done to ensure that jewish criminals that were hanging on the crosses uh... would have died before sundown you're back to that six p m. thing allowing them to be taken down according to jewish law now here's the thing the romans didn't give a hoot about the whole procedure this was done as an appeasement to the jewish nation so that their religious observances would be carried out according to their tradition the romans didn't care they didn't care about religious traditions of another culture didn't make any difference to them what they were interested in was subjugating the jewish nation they did not want civil unrest they did not want riots mostly peaceful or not they did not want riots they did not want their troops murdered on the street corners after dark they did not want insurrection going on throughout the land and so forth and to them it was perfectly ok you guys so long as it keeps you happy and it doesn't intrude upon our control our being the roman empire we don't care what you do religiously knock yourself out made no difference to them whatsoever so as an appeasement you know they said they would go and figure out which ones were jews they already knew that type of thing and maybe they just broke the legs of all of them i have no idea uh, but they would then break the legs in order to speed up death now if these people were put on if they were still alive on the afternoon late afternoon before the jewish sabbath they would go by and break the legs of everybody now this served a couple of different purposes uh, as well but we'll get to that in a moment what's this whole dying on the cross thing well deuteronomy 21 is, is part of the law of the jewish nation it says if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and be put to death and you hang him on a tree okay his body shall not remain all night upon the tree but you shall bury him that day for he that is hanged is accursed by god and there's a purpose for it so that the land will not be defiled okay so the intricacies of the mosaic law economy by the way that's also quoted by paul in galatians chapter 3 uh, rome didn't care uh, non-jewish corpses that didn't have families or people to take the bodies down off the crosses the romans just left them hanging until they putrefied completely okay this made a telling statement in effect when you walked into the gate of a city you were walking by a string of crucifixion uh, events that would have people that were crucified today yesterday last week maybe two months ago you know and the birds and the jackals and everything that could get to them and they just rotted apart the romans left them there it says you mess with roman sovereignty yeah you guys can do what you want but you mess with rome this is what happens to you it's called a detrimental proclamation okay it gets people's attention that you're not just going to get a slap on the wrist and turn back loose you know to the streets of new york to commit another crime this afternoon you know we're going to take care of you buddy and they did big time as well the leg break breaking speeded up the dying process because it is quite possible for a strong resilient individual to hang for days upon a cross after being crucified before they actually die uh, you know the process in and of itself uh, doesn't kill you it's everything the, the exposure and the dehydration and everything that goes with it so they would break the legs because for one reason the increased pain would lead to shock there was a also the aspect of with broken legs the victim would not be able to push himself up to get his diaphragm up to allow him to breathe 
he'd have no way to keep that, so he would be hanging just by the wrist, the nails embedded in the wrist. I know, you know, you always see the pictures of in the palms, you know, but if you do that, all that will just rip out. The weight of most human beings will rip out. There's nothing there. You stick it in between the wrist bones, the nail in between the wrist bones, and it's very effective in what it was designed to do. With the broken legs, they could not push themselves up. The diaphragm would fail to work in short order, you know, and essentially they would asphyxiate, lack of oxygen, along with the shock, loss of blood, the beatings, the scourgings, and so forth. Pretty ugly, pretty ugly way to die. And again, the Romans crucified, the Jews did not. The Jews stoned people to death, equally brutal in its own way, of course. Now, various, you know, you, what, you've got some different thoughts on some of this. I'll give you some of them as we go through. Some of them make sense, okay? The verse 34 talks about the piercing by the spear. By the way, this is another proof, we're going to talk about that in a moment, of the death of Jesus, that he was actually dead, okay? A Roman soldier came by and saw that, you know, for all, well, he looks dead to me. I don't see him breathing. He's just hanging there. You know, well, rather than go through the effort of, of breaking the legs, uh, which they usually did with a big hammer thing and broke the, up on the thigh bones. They didn't break the lower bones, they broke the thigh bones. Uh, in any case, uh, so he ran a spear up into him. I say up into him because the spear was normally inserted underneath the rib cage. Okay. The problem with running metal through the rib cage is, you know, whether it's swords, spears, pikes, whatever, is it'll hang up the weapon. Okay, it on a, on a very practical. Their own soldiers are very practical. They made their living being doing what they did, you know. And so to check, they'd run the, the spear up under the la the bottom rib, up into the pericardium. That's the heart sac. Okay, uh, normally, so you'd run the spear through at least one lung and in all probability through the heart itself uh, as well. Now, blood and water comes out, uh, a stream which flow when the, when the spear came back out. Uh, some view this as more of a sacramental concept, but most likely it emphasizes the physical body and the death of the physical body. Having a spear run through your heart is usually pretty much fatal, okay? Yeah, uh, you kind of get the idea of what is being dealt with. In verse 35, John, and that's probably the best understanding of how that's phrased, and he saw, remember John never speaks of himself as John, okay? He, he, he doesn't do that. He never actually identifies himself with the proper name. But he that saw this, and we know John was there from the earlier text, he says, bears record, and his record is true. He knows what he says is true, and there's a purpose for this, so that people will believe that Christ died. That's what he's talking about in this context here. Yes, he's going to be resurrected, and that's part of it, but here the context is that physical death actually occurs heard, okay? There is no swooning, okay? There is no fainting. There is no, you know, passing out momentarily or whatever, you know? Uh, Jesus has had a spear run through his chest cavity, piercing his heart. Uh, he's dead. Okay? He died previously, by the way, uh, you know, before the spear ever went in. By the way, both Exodus, you've got two quotes here in verses 36 and 7. There are one, the first quote is from Exodus, the second is from Zechariah, and both of them attest to the fact that the fulfillment of Scripture is both literal and absolutely accurate. Okay? Uh, these things were prophesied centuries before Christ was ever born you know, in, in humanity, and now they are perfectly being fulfilled, which is why we can expect unfulfilled current prophecy 
to come true in the same way because that's the way it's always been in the past. You don't change the procedure in the middle. Now, just a note here. Going clear back 1,500 years before Christ, you had the initiation of the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb never had a bone broken in his body. He was taken with his throat cut and eaten whole and so forth. There were never any bones that were broken. It tells us in Corinthians that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Again, the accuracy of what scripture is laid down for us. There is an issue that I'm choosing to emphasize a bit here because it affects even us today in some areas. And that's the confirmation in this text of the actual physical death of Christ. And most of us here are going to go, well, yeah, duh, that's obvious, right? I mean, everybody knows that. Everybody understands that. Not really so. Okay, hang on a minute and I'll help explain it to you. Okay, we can, in some cases, also get somewhat distracted by the spear thrusting and the leg breaking and, you know, and so forth. While that is recorded and we need to understand it, there's something that sometimes we fail to see the forest for the trees if you're not careful. Most of us in modern times, unless you've been off to a, uh, a seminary someplace or something are not really familiar with the Gnosticism and Docetism. Okay, and you go, who, what, huh? Yeah, right. It's, uh, yeah. Well, they were heresies in the first century that arose almost immediately following the resurrection. Okay, between them, they comprised the fact that they claimed that Jesus, one, didn't actually die, Two, never actually had a human physical body. Or that three, even though he had a human physical body, his actual spiritual being departed you know, before his physical death occurred. Okay? Uh, which means his physical body would have died, but Jesus didn't. The book of Colossians, by the way, though most of us may not recognize it initially, uh, the book of Colossians was written... Uh, as a counter of those heresies, those false teachings. Uh, you know, that's what the book is about. And often we read it more on a devotional basis, but in its theological and doctrinal perspective, it is a counter to false teaching concerning the body and person of Christ. Okay. It would seem that with the emphasis of John's record, especially John's gospel focused upon the deity of Christ, the inclusion of this almost almost an addendum in some ways points to the certainty that Jesus, God's son, certainly while both God and man died on the cross. Paul, by the way, additionally addressed this for the church age. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We will recognize that, of course, as what we call the Easter chapter or the resurrection chapter. But it begins with a very clear, one of the clearest statements of the gospel message and process found in Scripture. And Paul is refuting also this whole impact of Gnosticism and Docetism and, and so forth in the first two verses. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also have received, and wherein you stand, by which you being saved, if you are keeping in memory what I preach to you, unless your faith is a futile one. No, you can put faith in false things. You, know, you can put faith in Buddha. Buddha's not going to get you to heaven. You can put faith in Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith's not going to get you to heaven. You can put faith in the Pope. The Pope's not going to get you to heaven. Okay? God says there's one way to get to heaven, okay? and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So beware of false faith, and that's what Paul is addressing. Okay? He says in verse 3, I delivered to you, first of all, this is a very foundational premise of all of your faith, 
that which I received, he said, I got it from God himself, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? Now, just to point out the obvious, okay, it, uh, you don't bury somebody who swooned. Okay? You don't bury somebody who just fainted. You bury dead people. I'm not trying to be grisly at all. I'm just pointing out the fallacies of some of these heretical statements that you wind up with. Okay? First of all, that Christ died for our sins, just as it was predicted in the Old Testament. That he was buried, because that's what you do with people who die. Okay? And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Once again, prophetic fulfillment and everything that goes with it. You know, I bring this up also be to, so that you can recognize that this is not this Gnosticism, Docetism, and so forth, asceticism, and et cetera. Okay, the various variations uh, didn't just disappear in the first century. These things are in various cult groups today, the various isms and usms and so forth, uh, adopt in some cases all, in some cases part of these things, and bring all kinds of confusion to a lot of different people who are searching for the truth. Okay? Uh, you see, if you're going to package it in a nutshell, it kind of goes like this. If Christ, perfect deity in humanity, the God man, if he did not, if he did not die on the cross, then your sin is not paid for. That's how important that is. Okay? God had to die okay, in his perfect humanity to bear the sins. If he just swooned or escaped or you know ran off and hid or somebody snuck him down when nobody was looking you know, and, and hauled him off to the Sea of Galilee or something, uh, then you're still dead in your sin, so am I, okay? okay? The Christian faith, by the way, would be then a mockery, and believers are falling alive, okay? First Corinthians, if you go on in the passage, you know, talks about that we are the most ridiculous and despised and to be pitied, if in fact the resurrection did not take place. You can't have a resurrection if somebody didn't die first. You know, can I kind of add that in there? Okay, back to first, or back to John 19, and we look at that second portion, verses 38 through 42, that really change the subject, uh, go to be the preparation of the body. It says, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. I know that's a, that's a King James word of saying, gave him the authority to do so. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night, that was in the garden, and, brought, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. They took the body of Jesus, wound it in linen clothes with the spices and the manner of the Jews is to bear it. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein no man had yet been laid. Then, laid the, then they laid Jesus because of the Jews preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. That's where they put it. <laughs> Just some observations. John records Joseph as being a secret disciple of Jesus. But he went through channels, so to speak. Uh, and knowing the politics of the Sanhedrin, because he was a member of that group, he went to Pilate and got permission from Pilate uh, as far as the what we'd call the disposition of the body, right? To take that down. Matthew records that this sepulcher was brand new and was <clears throat> Joseph's personal tomb. In other words, he was preparing a place for his own body when that time came and other members of the family as well. 
by the way, most sepulchers had multiple platforms. I don't know how well, how familiar you are with them. Emily and I were able to go into one that we have no, nobody knows which sepulcher Jesus may or may not have been. They didn't even know for sure where Golgotha was, not in a technical sense. But you have multiple platforms inside. There's a main tunnel entrance, you know, and then on both sides of that tunnel, as far back as it goes, you will have multiple platforms, sometimes one over another, and sometimes a series of them. You can have four, six, eight, depending upon the size of the tunnel, how structural the rock environment is, and so forth, everything that goes with it. Okay, so that is kind of the picture there. By the way, they are not roomy. I know we all see pictures, especially at Easter, of something that has a tunnel. It's got a 12-foot ceiling in it. You know, uh, they didn't waste that kind of labor on bodies. Okay, uh, they made just as big a tunnel. You know, it, uh, Emily had to stoop a little bit to get through the entrance and through the main passage. You know, and then the individual little wall room, kind of a room, open room type of thing, you know, with shelving, you know, that you could tuck a body onto. Uh, you know, that's the, the, the picture that you have here, okay? Uh, but we, we know that Pilate goes to get that, and it is Nicodemus then that provides the burial spices, uh, by the way, a, a, a large and generous and expensive amount is indicated here. This is a rather large thing. Uh, the Jews did not embalm. That's, they got to go back to Egyptian times for that. Uh, and the spices had nothing to do with embalming. Uh, <laughs> on a very practical basis, they were primarily to mask the odor. Okay. Uh, coming out of a body that had already started to corrupt by the time they got it off a cross. And it allowed them to handle the corpse without really undue hardship, uh, you know, as far as getting the corpse from point A to point B. Verses 40 through 42 suggest a rather hurried preparation time, don't they? You know, if the sun is going down, this, this high holy day is... is is just about to start at 6 p.m. as the sun goes, to, and they've got to get the body off the cross. They've got to yank the spikes out. They've got to take the whole thing down. They've got to figure out how to get the body into some type of a canvas or you know, onto some type of a pole business so that they can carry the body from the place of crucifixion uh, to the tomb. Apparently, they're fairly close together. That's what is indicated here. They didn't have, at least that was probably a blessing that is there. Uh, so there was close proximity in this particular case between these. Now, if Christ hung on the cross from what you and I would concern, uh, see in other, the other gospels, uh, basically from noon to 3 p.m., that would leave the soldiers arriving to break the, the bones between 3 and 3.30 and the clarification and legal notice that they're all dead. Now the family members can come take down the bodies. And again, if there were no family members or anything else, the bodies just remained there. Okay, and they were just considered cursed. Well, Nicodemus and, and Joseph show up. We know that there are other family members, Mary and Mary's sister and Mary Magdalene and John is there and so forth, but they're not specifically referred to in this part of the text. So it's the, it, the duty goes to Nicodemus and, you know, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, both members of the Sanhedrin. Okay? It's a kind of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus from the garden. You know, <laughs> type of thing, okay? It, uh, but Jesus, uh, you, with, between the crucifixion and everything involved, there would have really been a rather short period of time uh, in order to get the, this, 
winding and spicing all wrapped up. The Jews normally use strips of cloth and wound. Uh, you know, uh, you can refer back to like Lazarus when he came out of the tomb when Jesus called him forth with his grave clothes and everything that goes with it. Uh, so there would have been a, a fairly short period of time which would have meant in Jewish culture that probably following the whole Sabbath thing that the women uh, that you read of in the next chapter that were heading for the tomb probably had the job of rewrapping, respicing, making sure uh, that the body was properly done because it had been such a hurried thing, you know, in the days previous when Joseph and Nicodemus were involved. Okay. By the way, uh, kind of not really a side note, but have you stopped and thought that the this action by Joseph and, and Nicodemus was a rather risky one on a personal basis. I mean, this is an open declaration of they're willing to be identified with this Jesus of Nazareth guy. Uh, this is this is a, as a political slash uh, uh, religious statement, uh, they're you know sticking their necks out. Jesus has been condemned, uh, flogged, and then crucified unto death as a criminal. And now they are honoring his body, his memory, and they're taking a real chance. And Joseph especially, he's got a brand new tomb. Yeah. And Joseph has the body placed in that tomb. Wow. It, uh, see? And by the way, remember, please remember uh, that Matthew 27 records that Pilate had granted the Sanhedrin a guard detail to secure the tomb. So the Romans knew about it, the Sanhedrin knew about it, the Pharisees knew about it, every, this was common knowledge. Okay? And Joseph and Nicodemus are right in the middle of everybody knowing that they're personally involved, you know, identifying uh, with this prophet from Nazareth, quite a deal, really is. Okay. It, uh, now you don't get a lot of other stuff, you know, concerning the, you know, the, the stone being put in place and the seals and the Roman guards and all that. Yeah, look at the other gospel accounts to, to flesh that out a little bit, okay? All right, so, Some of you, at least, are probably old enough to remember the <coughs> cliffhanging perils of Pauline. Uh, serials that were on the Saturday movies, Saturday afternoon matinees. The, the uh, audiences were left every week on the edge of their seats, you know, anticipating how Pauline was going to be getting out of this cliffhanger. You know, the cliffhanger, by the way, earned its name back in the days of yore because they literally left somebody hanging on the face of a cliff, you know, in different episodes. So it was kind of fun. Okay? But, you, would, you know, how was, is, how is the heroine going to escape the clutches of villainy? You know, and you're kind of anticipating everything else. You know, uh, the text that we leave today if you were experiencing it then, would be a perils of Pauline, kind of. It's not for us, because all of you rascals have read chapter 20, where we know that Christ rose from the dead, right? It, uh, you know, we understand that, and that, that is part of our, our Christian understanding, our Christian heritage, and teaching everything that goes with it. But the believers of that time, the apostles, the family members, and everything that were involved, uh, even Joseph and Nicodemus, there's a significant difference because what they had at this point was no hope. They had no hope. Okay? They had put their hope in Jesus. And Jesus, right in front of their eyes, had been crucified and was dead and now was wrapped up 
and placed in a tomb. They had placed their faith in Christ as God's Messiah, the deliverer, the one that would lead them onto the path of righteousness. Yeah. And now they see him die. He's been nailed to a tree, yielding up his spirit, pierced by a Roman spear as proof of his death. Now he's taken down from the cross, wound in burial sheets, covered with spices and laid in a tomb. That's where you put dead people. Their hopes at that point were equally dead. They had everything that they had hoped for had come to a crashing halt with the death of Christ. Life had fled. Death had replaced it. Hope had vanished away. Okay. Arrested, tried, killed, and entombed. The Sanhedrin probably celebrated. Satan probably danced in glee. Okay. But heaven is watching. Okay. Yeah. Heaven is wide awake and watching. The righteousness of God has now been satisfied. Redemption's plan has been completely fulfilled. It is finished. And you, well, as Paul Harvey used to say, you got to come back next week for the rest of the story. <laughs> okay, let's close. Father, thank you that you have provided a couple of I guess, vignettes, uh, addendums, uh, portions of details that help us recognize uh, the reality of the crucifixion and, Lord, the response of men of faith who were willing to put their lives out on the, on the, out on the chopping block, so to speak, as they identified with Jesus. I don't know how else to even think of it, but Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had to have a love relationship. It had to be more than just the intellect or the academical or academic part. It had to be something more profound, richer. It had to be, they had to have love for this man, this Jesus of Nazareth who had died. Uh, Lord, they uh, put themselves out there because of that. And I think we need to be as well, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our work in the Lord is not in vain. Uh, it serves your purposes, we pray, and we ask that we too would be willing to stand when needed. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>